Y'all having fun in rough and rugged Wyoming? Yeah, I thought so. This is a beautiful state. So what are we doing here today? Well, this is a hackathon. And these hackathons are very unique and special. Why? Because the technology that the industry works on is led by developers, the people here. Okay? And it doesn't matter if you're Avalanche or Harmony One or Algorand or Ethereum, Cardano, EOS, Tezos. Yeah, they all hate each other online, but the reality is 98% of the concepts are basically the same. If you think about it under the hood. The point is decentralization. The point is that we are actually in charge of building things that pushes power to the edges. And you get to think real hard about different concepts. You get to think about identity. You get to think about privacy. You get to think about what does it actually mean in practice, day to day, I'm going to the gas station to buy cigarettes to be my own bank. You get to think about value stability. Okay. So what the hell does that mean? Well, we've been printing a lot of money recently, haven't we? And everybody keeps telling us, oh, there's no inflation. Anybody buy any ply board recently? <laughs> Yeah. So USD is not doing so good. Inflation's bad. So what makes a good currency? Is it just a restrained monetary policy? Well, we got some people in this room that really strongly believe about deflationary monetary policy. 25 years ago, you talked to any single economist, any school of economics outside of Austrian economics, and you ask them about deflation, they'd say, oh, we've gone down that road before. 1880s, deflationary spiral. It doesn't work. My God, all those farmers got wiped out. Uh, you know, that's why they wanted the silver standard because gold standard was killing them. Oh, deflation's a bad thing. A hundred years ago, we closed that book. Well, now we're actually having that conversation again with Bitcoin. Nation states are. Competition of currencies. What's so cool about the people in this room is that you too can be monetary pioneers. You can build algorithmically generated stable coins. You can build layer two protocols, layer one protocols. You can work on existing projects. You can start new projects. There has never been a time in human history where so few could have so much impact for so many. And that's what makes these events special. Now, you know me for Cardano. And one of the big things in Cardano is the peer review process. And, you know, this is probably one of the most misunderstood processes, I think, in the industry. And I'd like to defend it a little bit, if anything, because I'm standing next to a university podium. So it affords me that opportunity. The point of peer review, does anybody really truly know it? It's got two points. One is that how the hell do you know the stuff on the paper works and it's right? Honestly. Everybody has provably secure. Everybody's got the protocol that works until it doesn't. And the problem is we have perverse financial incentives in this industry. When you build something and you deploy it to thousands, to millions, to tens of millions, to hundreds of millions of people, and those things blow up, do you pay for that? No. More often than not, the people who end up getting screwed are the people who consume that thing. And you say, oh, well, they should have known, buyer beware. People put their life savings into these things. There's a moral obligation that the work you do has some rigor behind it, commensurate to the value at risk. And if our industry is commanding valuations in the billions and trillions, shouldn't the industry then use the same engineering techniques and thought and methodologies that we use for the airplanes in the sky? Pretty standard thing. You can disagree and say, oh, but time to market is all that really matters. Well, we have several catastrophic events. Maybe that'll regulate our industry out, or at least damage and slow it down. Or open a window for Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, Google, these platforms to come in and launch their own products that they claim are cryptocurrencies or are not. And I'm telling you, competing against somebody with a network effect of 3 billion, that's a lot harder than competing against 80,000 Solidity developers. I'll take 80,000 Solidity developers any day over Facebook or Amazon or Apple or Microsoft. Don't give the vampires an invitation into the house. Second, founders die. They retire. They get fired. Believe me, I know a little bit about that. And guess what? You cannot rely upon the brilliance of an individual if you truly believe in decentralization. 
This industry was founded by an anonymous person who is gone. How many code commits came from Satoshi Nakamoto over the last 10 years? None. Yet we have Bitcoin. It's worth a trillion dollars. Exactly, Rich. So what does that tell you? It tells you you need a system to replenish brilliance. It's one thing to build a system that all you can do is push value around. It's another thing to build a voting system. It's another thing to build the back end of a nation state. It's another thing to build something that a billion people are going to use, and it's fair. This requires some of the most complex protocol thought and design that mankind can come up with. The process upon which we're going to get there and ensure that nobody owns it, it's patent-free, royalty-free, it's not controlled by a company or an individual, and it's not reliant upon a founder or leader is the peer review process. This is why we care so much about universities. Every single year, people here find graduate students or at Carnegie Mellon or at MIT or somewhere else. And those graduate students, they want to win a game. It's called Be the Good Academic. And what do you have to do to be a good academic? You got to write papers. I'm never very good at it, so that's why I didn't get a PhD. Although we hire people who are. We're at 117 of those. And you know what? To win, you got to write papers. Those papers have to solve problems. They have to be novel and interesting. So if we can get the academic community to align its interests with our interests, suddenly you have the world's largest distributed brain working for you all across the world. Now, what gender is that brain? It's none. What race is that brain? It's none. They're all across the world. It's egalitarian. It doesn't have a face. Now tell me, we were founded by a founder with no gender and no face, no language, no ideology. That's where Bitcoin came from. So let's replicate that. Let's create a decentralized brain. And that's the point of peer review. You know what? The industry as a whole is starting to realize that. You have great projects like Avalanche is represented here. It was born of that society. Algorand is here. It was born of that society. Even Ethereum itself is starting to write papers, rigorously look at things, think about things. Because of necessity, the protocols are just simply too complicated. Don't believe me? Tell me, how the hell do you process a million transactions per second? How do you preserve the principle of inclusive accountability? Does anybody know what that principle is? It's a principle that is the bedrock of the entire industry, yet it is completely at the mercy of scale. It's the idea that you can check in each other's homework. You don't trust anybody in crypto land. You don't wake up and say, well, Bob told me so, and therefore it's true. What do you do? You say, oh, well, I have a copy of the blockchain. You send me that transaction, I can check it, and I can verify if it's real. Those tokens are there. It's been spent. Okay? But how the hell do you check it when the blockchain's a petabyte, an exabyte, a yottabyte? How do you check it? when you have to have a fiber optic internet connection. Can grandma do that on a cell phone connected to a crummy Wi-Fi router? No. So does she truly have inclusive accountability? Is the morality we've pushed, this idea of homogeneity, this idea that the system is self-checking, self-healing, self-validating, really truly honored? Not exactly. So how do you get out of it? You need to invent new protocols. And we have them, recursive snarks, these roll-ups, Protocols on market like Mina and others that people have been playing around with. The proof of work world, we invented some proofs called NEPA PALs, non-interactive proofs of proof of work. Silicon Valley guys took that and they've been playing with it. And they have something called Fly Client now. The beautiful diversity of thought. Now, those things give you the ability to preserve inclusive accountability. But that's just one of dozens of principles that are at odds with each other. How many of you have witnessed recently the regulatory surge that we're under? Uniswap's under investigation, Ripple got hit. All these things are happening. We're moving through the great regulation of the cryptocurrency space. And what does that mean? There's going to be a lot of open and interesting questions about so many different topics. What is a stake pool? What is it? We have an opinion. Ethereum has an opinion. The industry has an opinion. Nation states have opinions. What does it mean for a nation to hold and own and legitimize a cryptocurrency? El Salvador just said Bitcoin's a currency. Shouldn't the United States then honor that and say, well, I guess Bitcoin is a currency? Well, they're not, but yet they have these reciprocal agreements. So they're actually in violation of treaties. Go figure. Well, what does that mean? What's the recourse for that? 
dozens and dozens and dozens of these questions. Where does identity fit in all of this? When the systems were created, they were pseudonymous. Is that how the world works? Does somebody send you an email and say, hey, you've never met me, but can you give me a loan for $100? You ever get one of those emails? Would you do it? What if you knew the person? Well, how can you know the person? What does it mean to have an identity in a decentralized world? Our industry is tackling this very topic. Some of you here at this hackathon might even be a consumer of this. The DID, the decentralized identifier, or something like that. We're exploring that domain. How do you create self-sovereign identity? How do you own your own identity? How do you make sure that Facebook and Microsoft and Google and Apple don't get to decide who you are? And what does reputation mean in this new world that we run our way into? Years ago, I was at the hackathon. I attended a, a lecture by someone from Consensus. It was a very nicely done lecture. It was on NFTs right here in this hackathon. It wasn't in this building. It was another. And he said, oh, man, these NFT things are going to be huge. And I said, you mean to tell me that somebody is going to take a picture of a blade of grass or a rock, and they're just going to put it online, and they're going to sell it for a million dollars. And he said, yes, I mean to tell you that, Charles. God, I wish I was right on that one. <laughs> we'll get into it. I'll tokenize my bison. Actually, that lobster on my microphone is probably going to sell for a lot. We're all a winner with NFTs. But what the heck are NFTs? God, God if I know. You know, and so what, what does it mean? It means we have to stretch the bounds of intellectual property. We have to actually understand, okay, if you're an artist like Aerosmith or Rolling Stones and you have these binding agreements with all these record labels and you decide to take some of your albums and NFT them, does your you know, music studio get a cut of that? Does the artist get to keep 100% of that? How does that work? Can you sell it again and again and again? Can you do one on Ethereum, one on Solana, one on Cardano? How does any of this stuff work? The answer is nobody knows. How do I know that? Because I called the guys who were doing it. They don't know. I wanted to know. I was like, tell me the standard. We'll create a SIP. That's great. You know who's going to solve it? Probably someone in this room or someone like you. Probably someone young. Because you'll get successful. It'll become the network effect. And whatever mistakes you make, we have to live with. And that's uh, how I'll close this. A few years back, we had a conference where we invited Vint Cerf to come and speak. It was at the Shelley Summit. And Vint is a really special guy. Does anybody know who Vint Cerf is? Show of hands. Some people do. Okay. This is one of those weird things where every single one of you should know who Vint Cerf is. How many people know who PewDiePie is? Vint Cerf invented the internet. <laughs> So him and Bob Kahn, they were working at DARPA back in the day. So I called up Vint. I said, Vint, I'd like you to come to a panel at our summit. And he said, what do you want me to talk about? And I said, Vint, it's a very simple topic. Uh, you can go as far as you want with it. But the question is, just one question, if you got a do-over and you could invent the internet all over again, what would you do differently? Now that you've had 40 years of hindsight. It's a good question, right? And we had a whole hour, and the videos are still up online if you're interested. But the long and the short is that we don't tend to think of the creations that we have this way. We tend to be so short-term, narrow-sighted in what we do and how we approach things. It is so easy for a decade to pass, 20 years to pass, 30 years to pass. It's so easy to start something and not anticipate how far that thing can go and where it can go. The decisions you make here as entrepreneurs and we make as an industry I know for certain are going to impact the entire human race. That's why in just 12 years time, we've gone from a single node to an ecosystem that covers hundreds of millions and trillions of dollars of value in all this activity. You are stewards of the future of humanity in this respect. These hackathons are vital, not because there's prizes and it's a good way of demonstrating the latest and greatest of platforms because they're vital because these are the moments where you get to share ideas and principles with each other. It wasn't too long ago in the arc of history that a young Steve Jobs met Steve Wozniak at a homebrew computer club. Didn't look much different from this. In fact, it was far less grand. There was no money. There was just passion. The knowledge, the thoughts, the ideas that they had there defined the entire personal computing revolution. They had no idea at the time. For better or for worse, the decisions they made, we live on that vector. And that's where you're at. 
So do take it seriously in that respect and try to think about the future of what kind of world would you like to live in? What type of rights would you like to have? How would you like to relate to people? How would you like to treat people? That's the real value of coming here. And those are the real conversations you all should have with each other in a certain respect. And you know what? If we do have that, we learn to listen and have a bit more empathy from time to time. I have no doubt that the world you leave behind will be far better than the world that gave us PewDiePie. Thank you so much.